Well, let's go ahead and turn your Bibles to the book of Acts, Acts chapter 5. We're, we're picking up exactly where we left off last week. We, last week we left off at chapter uh, 5, verse 11. Today we're going to pick up in verse number 12. It's a really long passage, so I'm not going to read the entirety of it, but we are going to break it down and see what the Lord wants to speak to us today through that, narr- that narrative of verses 12 through 42. And so before we get into the word itself, let's go ahead and just bow our heads and our hearts especially and ask the Holy Spirit to help us to receive his word today. Father, thank you so much for the way that you uh, have revealed yourself to us, God. And one of the one of the awesome ways that you have shown yourself and continue to show yourself to us is through this, this word that is before us, Father. We're thankful, God, that you are a, a, a God of revelation. Yes. And I pray that today you would uh, use this word they're about to focus on, about your church, God, about who we are. And I pray that you would just uh, instill in us a very deep understanding of who you are first and foremost, but also what you do for us and what you want to do through us. God, today we stand and we sit as as your special people called by your name. And I pray that we would leave this house recognizing that truth. And we pray it in Jesus' name that we will become more like him. And if you love the Lord, say amen. Amen. Say amen again. All right. Well, I want to start today with just one question for you. And the question is this. Have you ever faced an impossible situation? Have you ever faced a seemingly impossible situation? I'd like you to raise your hands right now and just show by, by, by show of hands. You were facing something. You looked at it and you said, man, I, don't, I have no clue. I have no way of knowing how I'm going to get through this and, uh, and how it's all going to turn out, right? I think that all of us, most of us, if not all of us, have experienced that. And if you haven't experienced yet, I promise you, you will, right? Uh, many of you know that our youngest children, uh, Nelson and Amanda, they were adopted. God, in a very special way, provided uh, them and became part of our family. You know, there's two ways that someone can be part of your family, through birth and through adoption, right? And... Uh, the, the story behind the story, though, is that when we got the call to, to go and pick up our son, who was just a few days old at the time, we were told that he had a twin sister as well, but that the birth mother had chosen to keep the sister and, and then give up the son, the, the brother, for adoption. So we went ahead and picked him up, and, you know, inside of us, we're like, Lord, I, I can't imagine your will being that this brother and sister would be separated for all their lives. And so we really began to pray and, and, and uh, ask the church uh, to pray and, and pray that God would do this. It didn't seem possible. It, it really didn't. Uh, you know, there's a whole lot of legalities involved and all these things that, are, that, that are go, come into play. But we continued to pray and believe that God somehow, some way was going to do that. And, and of course, you know, four months later, we got a phone call. And the, and the words out of the adoption agency's mouth, it was a Christian agency, said, are you ready to pick up Nelson's little sister, right? And God provided in a miraculous way the reuniting and honestly the gift of Amanda to us as our daughter. And when we look at that, every time that I, that I see our kids, and, our, and, and all of my, our kids are miracles, but when I see what God did in Amanda and in Nelson, and especially in Amanda, it's always a testimony of God's amazing grace and his power to restore, to transform, and to rebuild broken lives. And maybe you're in a season of life today. Maybe you're watching this morning and you find yourself facing a situation like I asked you earlier, facing an impossible situation. Maybe you're going through something right now and, uh, and man, you just look and you think, oh, man, I feel like a failure in this, in this circumstance. Maybe you sit here today and you're feeling unworthy, unwanted, or unloved. And the obstacles that you are facing seem insurmountable. Here's the message that I want you to walk away with today. God is with you. God is for you. And his grace is enough for you. His desire for you is life. His desire for you is for you to have a good future, to have a full life, 
to experience him like you've never experienced him before and to give you the kind of life with a kind of purpose that you can't even dream of. I believe that truth. I believe that message with all of my being. I believe with all of my heart this morning, friends, that his love for you is unstoppable. It is unfailing, it is everlasting, and it is unstoppable. In our Ecclesia series, and if you have just joined us, we are started the book of Acts several weeks ago, and, and we've entitled Ecclesia, the church in action. And we're going through the book of Acts and seeing what the church looks like because we believe that that's what God wants us to look like. And the word ecclesia is the word that actually in the Greek is translated in our English translations as church. But it literally means it's an assembling together, a gathering of people who have been called out from the world, called out and assembled together around the message, the person of Jesus Christ. That's the church. And we recognize that the church is not a place you go to, it's not an event you attend, but the church is a people, a people with a calling, a people with a purpose, a people that, have, that God wants to use to impact this world that we live in. And as we read through the book of Acts, we recognize that these individuals were obedient to the man, Jesus Christ. They were obedient to the message of Christ. They understood their mission, but yet they constantly... Uh, They were constantly opposed, and they constantly experienced opposition. They constantly experienced persecution from outside, from the external opposition and internal opposition. But mostly there were the religious leaders of the day that did not like what they saw and heard in the church. And many will be thrown in, in prison, in jail, multiple times as you read through the book of Acts. It wasn't an easy life. It wasn't a life of favor that they called and confessed and everything went well. It was a life of of persecution, of opposition, of impossible situations, of pain, of suffering. It was that kind of life that they had to push through. But they did. They continued, no matter how much the opposition arise, through the power of the Holy Spirit, they continued to boldly witness for Jesus, declaring his truth, and experiencing the strength of God's grace in the midst of pain and persecution. And as a result, not only do we see the opposition they face, but we see the results of their continual faithfulness. We see lives changed, right? We see men and women transformed. We see communities up, 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 up completely overturned uh, from the ways of the world. We see riots, but the riots were because of the changes that occurred in the midst of the preaching of the gospel. We see miracles that were witnessed that always pointed to the miracle worker, right? But all of it happened in the midst of great opposition. I wasn't going to say this, but I'm going to say this that We live in a country that up to this point, we have lived in freedom as a church. And we have done what God has called us to do without any opposition. But friends, I don't know if you've been living under a rock or not, but if you haven't, you recognize that that is no longer the case here in this country that we live in. Yeah, we can still gather together like this and, and gather in a place like this. But listen to me. There is this spirit of Antichrist that is still very much at work. And they may not oppose you and persecute you right now and put you in in jail and prison. But there is a desire to do so. And when you stand for biblical truth, when you stand by the man, the message, and the mission of the gospel, you will be opposed. I promise you, you will be. It shows up in many different ways. But the reality is that God will still work through us. If we're obedient... Lives will be transformed. Communities will be changed. Acts 5, 14 says, Believers were added to the Lord in increasing numbers. Multitudes of both men and women. Right? They were opposed, but they continued to preach and teach and live the gospel. As a result, they would carry the sick out into the streets and lay them on cots and mats so that Peter, when, when Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. That's amazing. Verse 16, 
In addition, the multitude came together from the towns surrounding Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those who were tormented by unclean spirit, and they were all healed. It looks and sounds a lot like the ministry of Jesus, doesn't it? They continued to do and to teach what Jesus began to do and teach. I love what, what I love that just j- jumps out at me here is they knew where to go to find hope. They knew where to go to find life. They knew where to go to find the answers to their unanswerable questions. The church, because of their love, because of their, of their reflection of Jesus, was not a place that it was shunned by those that were in need. It was a place that they came to. That they went to. It was a people that they went to. And just like with Jesus, the persecution and condemnation rose up against them. So we saw, and we've already read, that Peter and John have already been arrested and spent time in jail, right? Uh, they had been charged by the religious authorities. They said, listen, I'm gonna, we're going to release you on one condition, that you stop preaching Jesus. Otherwise, you're going to face some dire consequences but they would not be stopped and in verse 17 says then a high priest rose up he and all were with him who belonged to the party of the Sadducees they were filled with jealousy oh we get a little insight to the into what's happening inside of them right so what do they do because the apostles didn't stop preaching but they kept preaching and teaching It says that they arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. Now notice that up to this point, it's Peter and John who've been arrested. Here, it's all the apostles, right? This time, all of the apostles, they said, listen, we haven't been able to stop any of them. Let's just bring them all together, right? And they stuck them not in some temple room, but in a public jail. Now, apparently, God had had enough with these jokers who were constantly pushing the pause button on the preaching of the gospel, Or maybe perhaps it was to stop any doubt or discouragement from settling in with the apostles. We do not know why he did what he just, he's about to do here. But it was a special moment that he does does this. He took things into his own hands. And in verse number 19 it says this. But an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail during the night, brought them out, and said. Let's read this next part together, will you? Go and stand in the temple and tell the people all about this life. Stop for a second. This life. This life. This life of Jesus is different from that life that's out there. If this life is the same as that life, we have not experienced this life the way we ought to experience this life. He says, you go and preach You go and teach about this life. What kind of life? Love and peace and power, persecution, opposition, and suffering. Hearing this, they entered the temple at daybreak and began to teach. How many of you would have loved, man, man, that's an amazing an angel coming and opening the door. How many would love to experience a miracle like that? Isn't that, isn't that awesome? Well, first you got to be thrown in jail for preaching the gospel. Just want to let you know that. <laughs> Here's what I want you to see. We can't experience resurrection miracles without crucifixion pain. We want the miracles without the pain. We want the miracles without the the cost. But friends, there's always a cost to serving Jesus. Can I hear an amen if you believe that? That's what he taught us. That's what we believe and that's what we experience. So the next morning, the, the, the Pharisees, the, the Sanhedrin, the Sadducees, they all got together. They, they convened the entire council together, these religious people. And the number one issue on the docket that morning were the apostles. So they call the the temple guards and say, go and get these apostles and bring them to us. We're about to bring the hammer down on them. So the guards go out to the jail and they get there and what do they find? An empty cell. They're gone. 
They run back to the Sadducees. They run back to the Sanhedrin. Dude, they're gone. They're, they've, they've escaped somehow. We don't know what happened. You, did you leave it alone? Oh, we locked it. I promise you. I don't know how they got away. And they're like, where, where are they now? I don't know. We don't know. How did they get out? We don't know. We don't know. All we know is that they've had all night to get away as far as possible from Jerusalem. We probably lost them. Until we read verse 25, and then someone arrived with startling news. The men you put in jail are standing in the temple, <laughs> teaching the people. Like, what do you think these guys thought at this point? These guys, are, these guys are crazy. We keep threatening them. We put them in prison. We do all these things. This is such an incredible picture of what the church is supposed to be like. This is what we see happening over and over again with the church of Jesus Christ, both here in the book of Acts and throughout history. Her mission of spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ is unstoppable. No matter what arises against the church, the church keeps going because Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That's the words of Christ. He is building it. He is building her ch his church. And nothing can stop her. It's happening today in Iran. It's happening in Cuba. It's happening in China. And I can keep naming. They stop. They try to stop. They imprison. They torture them. They kill them. But nothing is able to stop the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because it is not a normal message. It is a spirit-infused message. It is a life-transforming message empowered by the Lord himself. And I want you to understand that God's salvation story has not only been written, it continues to be written. Because as we study the book of Acts, we come to the conclusion that there is no conclusion. Acts chapter 28 does not have a formal ending. If you read it, like I asked you to do, you saw, you get to the end, you're like, is there, is there more? But that's on purpose, friends. Because the Holy Spirit wants us to understand that the book of Acts is still being written. The only question is, what part do we want to have in that history? What part are we writing in the book of Acts as a church, right? Because the book of Acts is a record of the Holy Spirit working through God's people, the church. And he hasn't stopped working through his people today. He works through anybody and everyone that allows him to use them. It's a portrait of what Jesus wants us to be. And, and, and if you want to be that kind of church, turn to somebody and say, that's the kind of church I want to be. Now, I, I pull out three very simple truths this morning. Very simple truths that I see in these events that we just are going through here in Acts chapter 5. And I want to just lay out these very simple uh, uh, truths. And then I'm going to give an opportunity at the end of this time together for us to, to spend some time seeking the Lord and, and worship with, to him and seeing what God wants to do in your life. You, whatever you're facing, he wants to work in your life today. And also, he wants to work through you. He doesn't just want to work in us, friends. So often we just come to him, do this in me, do this in me, do this in me. No, he does this in me. But he does it so that he can do this through me. He wants to use us, friends, to impact this world that we live in. So here are the, th the first of the three simple truths. As the ecclesia, Christ called out people. God calls us to do the impossible. God calls us to do the impossible. Here's what I've discovered, and maybe you have too, but very rarely will God ask you to do something that is super easy. Now, thankfully, he does. Right? There are things that he just says, do this, and you look at it and you say, okay, I just have to be obedient and do it. No problem. But there are times, friends, when he will ask you to do something. When he will ask you to do, to, to do something that seems impossible. And so the question is, why does he ask us to do what seems impossible? Why does he call us to do the impossible? Number one, so that only he can get the glory. Right? When, when something's done that's super easy, you're like, oh, well, that was, that was me. But when you do something, when God does something through you, 
that you in your own strength and your own wisdom and your own understanding or intelligence or experience, you could not have done. There's only one person that can get the honor and the glory for it. Only one person can get the credit for it. And so you give it to him. That's one reason he does it. But I think secondly, he asks us to do the impossible because, because it's only impossible from our perspective. <laughs> it doesn't, it's not impossible for him. When he says do this, it's a possible deal. From our perspective, it's impossible. Let me just give you a little example from our church family here, right? So in 2017, God moved upon us to, to do so, several things that, that, again, were not easy. Number one, God, asked, God moved on us to purchase the, the land to the north of us, right? He, he moved on us to build a kids' center for the generations to come. He moved on us to launch Muleshoe Campus, right? And when you added all that stuff together, it was over $3 million, which turned to somebody and say, we ain't got. <laughs> now, 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 listen, when God moved on that, do you think that didn't seem impossible to me? In fact, I said, God, can't you spread this out over the next five, six years? Why are you doing it all at once? Because he wanted to make sure that we recognized that only he could do it. Plain and simple, right? So what does he do? We obey and we leave the, res the, the, the results in his hands. We're not, listen, the results are not in our hands. The results are not our responsibility. Our responsibility is simple. Obey. If he says run through that, through that wall, I say, hey, John, come over here. Run. Let's see what the Lord... <laughs> We run through the wall. Listen, if we hit it hard, he's got a reason for it. But we, all our job is simple. It's simple. It's simple. It's simple. It's simple. It's yes, Lord, and obey. So we obeyed, right? And so what does God do? Within a few short months after we purchased that land to our north, God provided the million dollars to pay it off completely. We didn't know that. We didn't know that, but God did. Seemed impossible to us, but not with him, right? And so then we built this $2 million kid center, right, for the next generations, remodeled the youth center for the next generations, and then we upgraded other areas of this building, and we launched Center Point Church, right? And then we end up only borrowing a fraction of what it all costs. What is that? God. God. I can't take any credit for that. None of us can. Well, it's because I thought, no, no, listen. Our job was simple. Yeah. Obey. Number one, make sure you hear clearly from God. Yeah. Amen. Amen. <laughs> make sure that it's faith and not stupidity. <laughs> so you hear clearly from God, you obey him, and guess what? He does the rest. He does the rest. Amen. Yet... Let me just say this, as human beings, even when we have heard clearly from God, it's very easy to look at the magnitude of a problem that we're going through, of a situation that we're in, of a, of a certain issue that doesn't seem to want to go away, of a task that needs to be done, and we look at the magnitude of it and think, I can't do this, this is too much. This is too much for me to handle. It can't be God because God said he wouldn't give me more than he can handle. A lie. Yeah. God never says that he can, won't give you any more than he, you can handle. I don't know where that came from, but it's not in the Bible. He said he will not let you be tempted beyond what you could bear. But friends, he will let you get, get stuff in your life that you cannot bear so that, why? So that you can turn to him and find life and give him the credit and the glory, Right? But you're facing these things, and many times what happens is that we allow fear to begin to arise within us. A fear of maybe being wrong, a, a fear of failure, a fear of ridicule, a fear of rejection. And it's in times like that when we need to remind ourselves often that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Fear will never get you through difficult times. 
Fear will never let you overcome the circumstances that seem impossible. But love does. A sound mind can. And faith and courage will. Because courage, friends, is not an absence of fear. Courage is recognizing there is fear. You don't need, you don't need courage when there's no fear. I have no problem walking off of this platform and walking up with it. But you put me, you know, several hundred feet up in the air in a zip line, I need courage. Because <laughs> there's a whole lot of fear. <laughs> right? You only need courage when there's fear. But here's what courage is. Biblical courage is the will to persevere out of obedience in the midst of opposition. Peter and the apostles showed us what courage is. And you remember Peter, right? Peter was one of those disciples of Christ that, that obviously became a, a main leader, a main, a main preacher, teacher in the early church. But you know Peter. Come on, you read about him. Forget about him in, in Acts. Read about him in the, in the Gospels, right? He was a fisherman by trade. And yet his entire story, why did God let us see Peter the way that we see him in the Gospels? See, if there was a human being writing the biography, they would have taken all the bad stuff out. You ever read a biography? You're like, this guy was perfect. Jesus and this guy. You know? Why? Because human beings, we have a tendency to just kind of gloss over the bad. But God, I love it. He's a perfect historian, man. He gives us the good, the bad, and the ugly. And he shows us the real Peter before the transformation that occurs. Before the transformation of the heart and the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And in Luke 22, it says that Peter says, Lord, I'm ready to go to prison with you and even to die with you. Sounds good, doesn't it? Yeah. But God knows the heart. Jesus knew the heart. And he says, Peter, let me tell you something. Come here, Peter. I, I imagine him putting his arm around him. He said, come on, buddy. come here. Before the rooster crows tomorrow morning, you will deny me three times that you even know me. Of course, you know the story. He was oh, never, Lord, I won't. And he, he did. Jesus was arrested. Peter denied him three times. Why? Fear. He was fearful that he was going to experience the same thing he's seen his Lord going through. That if he, they knew that he was a follower of Jesus, they were going to arrest him and maybe do whatever they're going to do to Jesus. But then something happens in Peter, doesn't it? He encounters the living Christ, the resurrected Jesus. That resurrected Jesus through the power of the Holy Spirit transforms his heart. He is born again, and he is empowered on the day of Pentecost with the power of the Holy Spirit. Now we see a Peter who may have fear in his heart. We don't know that, but he isn't going to show it if it is. Instead, he says, listen, whatever comes my way, I don't care how I feel. I know what Jesus has called me to do, and I know the power he's given me to do it. So I don't care how many times they threaten me. I don't care how many times they arrest me. I'm going to do what God has called me to do. I'm going to preach the gospel. I'm going to live the gospel of Christ. And they told him to stop preaching multiple times. And when they did even this time, when they finally go and get him and bring him back from the temple, dude, we told you to stop preaching this Jesus. Stop preaching Jesus. This is your last chance. This is your last warning. And Peter says this in verse 29, along with the apostles, the other apostles. Come on, let's read that together. We must obey God rather than men. Can you personalize that? Instead of we, say I. I must obey God rather than men. Peter and the other apostles couldn't stop. They couldn't stop. They couldn't stop talking about Jesus. They couldn't stop talking about his good news. They had a mission from Jesus, and no one was going to stop them. They couldn't help but tell people about Jesus. They couldn't help it. They couldn't help it. Oh, that the church would be the same way again. And by the church, I'm talking about you, if you're a believer in Jesus. You know, some of us go see a good movie, and we can't help but tell people about it. Our team wins, and we can't help but tell people about it. 
Jesus dies a gruesome death in your place, is resurrected from the dead, has risen and ascended to the right hand of the Father, is coming back one day, and we have to prod and push to talk about him. He's changed our lives, transformed us, given us purpose and joy and peace that we never dreamed we could experience. And people have to prod us to talk about him. Come on, turn to somebody and say, that's not going to be me. I'm going to talk about Jesus. So here's the deal. God gives us this, this mission. And it may have seemed like a mission impossible. Right? Go and reach the world. You 120. You 500. You go and preach the gospel around the world. This world will be impacted by me. Really, Lord? But don't do it until you get the power. Don't start till you get the power, right? Because what is impossible with man is possible with God. I'm going to say that again. Let it sink deep down in your spirit. What is impossible with man is possible with God. God calls us to do the impossible. But with him, all things are possible. And secondly, God empowers us to be unstoppable. Not only does he call us to do the impossible, but then he empowers us to be unstoppable. Now, now, listen, if you go out and try to do it in your own strength, bless you. But if you go out in his power, bless you. Because God's going to use you. The more resistance, the more threats, the more violence the church came against, up against, the more unstoppable she became. I don't know if you found this out or not, but I found in my walk with Jesus, in my walk with the Lord, that he will, he's going to bring me through some very difficult circumstances that, again, are impossible in my own strength. And the reason he does is because I, he wants me to learn to completely rely on him. We're studying the book of Revelation on Tuesday mornings, and this past week, the men that were there, we saw that even in heaven, in the new Jerusalem, that there is going to be a tree that we eat of. And you say, well, why is that necessary for you to continue to have life in the new Jerusalem in heaven? And the reason is because even in heaven, God wants an eternal reminder that we are dependent on him for everything. We weren't there because of ourselves. We were there because of him. And we will be there for all eternity because of him. We continue through all eternity to be dependent on God. And yet we love to be independent of him. There's something inside of us that wants to buck our dependence on him. Right? Like when your kids get to a certain age, I don't need you, mom. I do it. Let me help you. No. There's something in it. Some of us are 45-year-old adults and we're still saying, no. I do it. To God. But what God wants us to do is get to the point where we can say and we can believe and we can confess the truth that Jesus said to Paul, my grace is sufficient for you. How do we find out that his grace is sufficient? It's not when everything's going great. And when we remember it's about God's strength and not our own. Then we are more willing to trust him with whatever comes our way. Then we are more willing to allow him to use us in whatever capacity he wants to use us. Why? Because we recognize it's not my strength, it's his. It's not my purposes, it's his. Remind you, rem, let me re, rem, remind you of something, that, that everything that happens in our story, our life, everything in our story as a believer in Jesus Christ must tie into the bigger story that he has for this world. He doesn't do anything in us just for our sake and for our story. It ties in to the redemption story that he has for all mankind. And so you never know how God's going to use you in that story. You never know how God's going to do it even. 
How many of you have ever faced an impossible situation and you came up with all the ways that God's going to get you out of that? And then he doesn't do any of them. It's like, well, I was going to use that, but since you said it, I'm not going to do it anymore. Because I want to do something that's going to that's gonna flip you out, that's going to show you that it, wasn't, it, didn't come up from, it didn't come from you, it's from me. And he does that with the apostles here. Because, listen, when they, when they put him in that last time, there was one thing in mind. They only had one thing in mind. That's, let's, let's just eliminate these guys. They won't listen to us. We've imprisoned them. We've done everything we can. There's only one option here. That's just, let's just kill them. They're blaspheming. You know, they always use the blasphemy deal to try to get rid of the people that they didn't want, right? So this time, they do the same thing. But when they gather together to conspire on how they're going to do it, this guy by the name of Gamaliel arises within their ranks. And, the, and he was a, probably one of the most um, revered of all of the Pharisees, of all of the Sanhedrin members in the time. He was actually Paul, the Apostle Paul's mentor when he was Saul, right? So this guy gets them all together and he uses his position of authority and his wisdom from God to advise the men of Israel, to, to advise these Jewish people to leave these apostles alone. Because Peter, when he said, you know, before he said, I have to obey God, he let him have it one more time. He said, listen, you guys killed Jesus. And he just preached the gospel again to him. And so they were furious. They wanted to kill him. But Gamaliel recognizes this truth. He recognized if it was God orchestrating this deal, if it was God that was behind these men, if it was God who was empowering them to spread this message of Jesus through Peter and the apostles, this is what he said. There is absolutely nothing that we can do to stop the move of God. And so in verse 38, he says, so now I tell you, stay away from these men and leave them alone. If their plan comes from human authority, it will fail. But it is from God, if it is from God, you will not be able to stop them. You might even be, what, fighting against whom? God himself. So Gammy, which is, I call him Gammy because we were in good, but Gammy may not have known this at the time. But God was speaking through him because he was declaring in a very prophetic way the truth. They weren't going to be able to stop him, and they didn't. And when they fought against them, they were fighting against God himself. What did Jesus say to Saul when he met him on the road to Damascus? Saul is going to persecute the Christians, to put him in prison. Some even get killed, and he stops them, he blinds them. And what is the, what is the question that Jesus says? Why are you persecuting me, Saul? When one of God's children is touched, God is touched. When people arise and fight against the people of God, the church of Jesus Christ, they are arising and fighting against God. And I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but God doesn't lose. So as a result of Gamaliel's speech, the apostles were not killed. But instead, they said, okay, fine. We're not going to kill him, but we're going to make this a little more painful than the other ones were. And so they took the time to flog them. The flogging would have been 39 whippings. The law of Moses gave, an, uh, gave the permission to flog someone who was a criminal, you know, by two or three witnesses, a very real criminal, 40 times. Anything past 40 was against the law because it would kill them. So the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees and teachers of the law, they said, well, let's just make it 39 in case we lose count. We don't want to go over so let's make it 39, and if we miss the count, it'll be 40. But 39 floggings, 39 whips with this leather whip with stuff attached to it. Listen, it could literally kill somebody. It would wrap around the front, rip them from the front back, all their shoulders, their back, everything. It would not just take care of the back. It was everything. That's what the apostles went through because they were criminals. No. Because they stole. No. Because they destroyed pro private property or pro public property, no. Because they preached the gospel. Because they taught, they stood and they teach Jesus. See, these men, these, 
they, they possess this spirit-empowered ability to keep their focus on the man, the message, and the mission of the gospel. And they had this incredible, uncanny ability because of the power of the Holy Spirit to see the greater picture of what God was doing through them on the earth. They didn't get so focused on what they were going through and the pain that they just suffered that they forgot the reason and the purpose behind it. Because God's purpose is bigger than us. I know it's hard to understand that when we're going through it. But if we just train our hearts and our minds to recognize that everything as a child of God, everything that I go through has a bigger purpose beyond me, beyond you, right? And they could have complained. They could have gotten angry. They could have been bitter with a situation like I see so many professing Christians do today. When something bad happens, they shake their fist at God and say, God, I can't believe you let this happen to me. I've been serving you and I've been doing this and that and now this is the way you repay me. They didn't do that. But instead they viewed their persecution and the pain and the suffering that they experienced for Jesus as a privilege. A privilege. When was the last time that you experienced something bad because of your faith in Christ and you experienced, you said, oh, this is a privilege for me? Because that's the mindset that they had. It's the mindset we ought to have. You say, well, what about the stuff that happens in my life, you know, that it wasn't because I was preaching Jesus or, or being a witness to somebody else? Well, if you're loving Jesus and you're following Christ and you're growing and becoming more like Jesus, whatever you experience from the enemy is because of the fact that you love Jesus. So you can say, you know what? I didn't bring this upon myself. Therefore, I counted a privilege to go through this for Christ because I'm a believer in Jesus. So what do they do after being put through such a traumatic experience? I mean, come on, man. Some people could barely walk when they were finished flogging them. Well, verse 42 tells us says, verse 41, the apostles left the Sanhedrin rejoicing that God had counted them worthy to suffer disgrace for the name of Jesus. Wow. Wow. And so they went home and they said, Lord, you know, let's just, let's just take it easy for a little while. You know, let's just recover from this stuff. You know, let's just, let's just think this through a little bit. Maybe we're doing it the wrong way. No, they had heard God clearly. So in verse 42, it says, day after day, in the temple courts, that's publicly. By the way, God hasn't called us to a private faith. He's called us to a public faith. It may be personal, but it's never meant to be private. Jesus didn't die privately for us. He died publicly for us. So day after day, in the temple courts, and from house to house, that's the huddle. They never stopped teaching. They never stopped teaching and proclaiming. They, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news. They never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Messiah. He's the Savior. He's the anointed one. He is the one that God has sent to save us, to change us. God had called them to do the impossible, but because with, all, with God all things are possible, if God is living in you by the power of his spirit, that what seems impossible is possible, and you will become unstoppable as you follow Christ. Amen. And you will discover this last simple truth, that God will never fail us. God will never fail us. When you and I walk in obedience to the call of God in the midst of impossibility, this is one truth that will hit you in the face every time. That throughout every situation, throughout every problem, throughout every situation and circumstance that you might face, God will never fail us. He doesn't call us to failure. He calls us and then he equips us and then he gives us all that is needed through his empowering presence to get the job done, to do it, to live it, right? And among the church that, that day, 
was a man by the name of Stephen. We're going to focus on him next week for Father's Day. It's a great picture of a godly man. But for now, I want you to know that he's described in Acts chapter 6, verse 8. He's described as a man full of God's grace and power. And he performed many miracles among the people. He wasn't an apostle, just an ordinary guy. But God used him to perform great miracles in the midst. And the wisdom that God gave him, as these guys try to argue against him, they couldn't overcome it. God gave them this incredible wisdom as he boldly declared the truth of Jesus, the gospel. And the account of this very significant event in Acts chapter 7, it tells us that Stephen looked up to heaven as he's being stoned. And he saw the glory of God. Look at verse 59. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. That's amazing. I wonder how many of us would just say, Lord, and, and, and make sure that these guys live the worst life they've ever lived again because of this. Lord, repay them according to their deeds, God. But he prays like Jesus. He says, no, don't, don't do this. See, even in the most painful moment of his life, Stephen chose. Come on, everybody say, I choose. He chose to set his eyes on Jesus. He released his murders through his declaration. And he understood that even in the worst of circumstances, I don't know what you're facing today, but even in the worst of circumstances, there is an opportunity in the midst of that pain, in the midst of that suffering, in the midst of the questions, in the midst of it all, there's an opportunity for God's glory to be made known. And God was able to use the martyrdom of Stephen, the first martyr recorded. He was able to use Stephen's death to inspire others, and it resulted in the scattering of Christians all throughout Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the world. The gospel, because of that death, began to spread throughout the, other, throughout the world. In other words, his death caused the fulfillment of what Jesus had promised, prophesied in Acts 1.8. He said, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea, and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Stephen's impact didn't even end at his death. We're going to see that next week. But God used the martyrdom of Stephen... To bring about incredible growth, expansion, and influence of the kingdom of God and brought many to experience eternal life. What seemed like an impossible situation, what seemed like something that no one would want to bring upon themselves, what seemed like a dead end became the beginning of new life and a pathway to salvation for many. Don't ever look at what you're going through as just you. But as a follower of Jesus, he wants to use what's happening to you to impact many for the glory of God. And no matter how bad things get, friends, you can be sure of this one truth. What's the truth? What's the truth that we're talking about here? What's the truth? What's the simple truth here in this last part? It's the third of three that I've given you. What is the third simple truth? Yes, thank you. I'm just going to talk to you from now on. <laughs> God will never fail us, friends. Come on, let's say that together. God will never fail us. I don't want you to forget this. God will never fail us. Turn to somebody and say, God will never fail us. And I don't know if you've noticed or not, but we live in a world of unprecedented hopelessness across every sphere, economically, socially, politically, emotionally, morally, and spiritually. Wherever you turn, it seems that there's overwhelming circumstances that people are facing every day. Our communities are filled with lonely, isolated people who have lost hope. Families are trying to put food on their table. Single parents are trying to raise their kids. People are fighting sickness and disease, grieving the loss of loved ones, and families are disintegrating. 
And it's easy to become overwhelmed by this broken world. It's easy to make excuses. It's easy to say, you know what? I know what we're called to do, but I can't do it because of the challenges that come with the journey. Yet I believe that this is the greatest hour for the church of Jesus Christ on the earth. We were born for this moment. We were born to bring life and life and freedom to a lost and broken world. And there's generations all around us that need to see what the church is supposed to be like. They need to hear the, what the church is supposed to be saying. They need to know the God who never fails. And they're going to know him through you. Because we serve a restoring and redeeming God. The God we serve, friends, is the God of hope. He's a God of second chances. He's the God of new beginnings. And while the world is wondering if there is hope, we know there is hope. And it came in the person of Jesus Christ. And through our relationship with him, and through our service for him, we will reveal the hope that lives inside of us. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, friends, how many things are possible? What about the bad stuff that's going in your life? How can God use that? For his glory. But it doesn't make sense. I, don't, I can't see the out. I, I, I don't see how. Oh, well, we don't have to. The results are in his hands. But here's what I do know. Here's what you can know. And we know that in all things, in all things, God works for the good of those who love him and have been called according to our purpose. No, his purpose. His purpose. Will you stand with me? And my prayer for you today is that you would know there is a plan for your life. That his will, his purpose, and his destiny over you is unstoppable as long as you're walking with him. And I pray that like Stephen, we would be full of God's grace and power to the point that we can impact our world the way he impacted his world. And recognizing that in our lives, his love will never fail us. That in our lives, God will never fail. And we can live the kind of life that shouts to the hopeless. And God will never fail you if you put your trust in him. So, Father, thank you so much for this time. And I pray, Holy Spirit, that you would do that work that only you can do in our hearts and minds. I pray for those, oh, Father, that are far from you, that at this moment they would draw near to you. For without you, there is nothing. There's no hope. There's no life. But with you, we have everything. I pray for those that are hurting right now that they would receive the balm that only you can bring, that healing balm, the healing of the hearts, the healing of the heart, of the mind, the healing of the bodies, to know that you are good and never fail us. And we can proclaim the good news of Jesus with all of our strength. In the name of Lord Jesus, I pray these things. Amen.